Thanks, Harpin. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, it's great to support the open source community. I, I would like to share a few slides and take you through a little bit of background on the company. Uh, you know, we are new in starting our journey here. We signed on this year in 2022 as a premier member in the LF Edge project, and we're excited to be part of that. Um, we have done a lot of work recently in our business to think about the edge. And our main uh, motivation is really to accelerate the edge infrastructure. And particularly, you know, as we get into 5G, that becomes even more critical, as we've seen from your discussion earlier, as well as Andre's presentation here, how important, you know, the transformation that's occurring at the network in, into a software-defined uh, platform and the leverage of open source, frankly, some of the security issues too play a key role. And as an end user, we see a lot of benefits in, in not having to you know, have these undifferentiated components of the, of the platforms be uh, rebuilt uh, in, in discrete ways. You know, we think there's a lot of leverage that's coming out of this. And frankly, some of the projects that we, we see in, LA, in the LF Edge uh, group is the Acrano work, obviously, with the 30 plus blueprints. There's a lot of work there that can help uh, our, you know, suppliers uh, deliver solutions to us in ways that are very uh, important. And also, you know, we started to follow and track for a number of years, the state of the edge report. We thought the taxonomy and the work that was done there to clarify you know, how people are thinking about the edge and defining the edge was really important. It really solves some of the challenges we have every day in trying to explain this area. So what I wanted to do is just cover a few slides, give some background, maybe you know, have some time for questions. So American Tower is a global business. You know, we're a tower company and have been from the beginning, right? So you know, we're, we're about 25 plus years old. And we are operating in 25 countries. Uh, we have 220,000 communication sites. And you can imagine when you start looking at this portfolio and the fact that as the world moves to 5G and the edge, there's a lot of opportunity for us to develop infrastructure and support our customers here, which are the service providers. And you know, we've been on the, the uh, journey of developing the tower business as an independent company for a long time. You know, In the key markets in the US and Latin America, we started you know, back in the late 90s. And what I wanted to talk about was, you know, how is this really changing when we get to 5G and the edge? Because we, we need to look at the latency and some of the components of what's driving those use cases and how do we want to get, you know, closer and closer to the source of data as opposed to sort of downlink oriented structures. We have a lot of IoT, a lot of sort of innovation occurring at the edge with devices, and they need to have data process and workloads closer to the uh, tower sites, we believe. And so one of the things we did in, in, in this particular slide, you'll see um, the, the, the opportunity here came up last year for the company. And we actually acquired a company called CoreSight US, which is one of the largest heavily interconnected data center companies in the US. And what you look at here in this slide is really this com, uh, convergence of you know, the network providers, which are the history of, of a lot of these interconnection locations. But more importantly, how enterprise and cloud are come together at these locations. And when you overlay that with our tower portfolio in the US of 43,000 plus towers, you can now see the densification that can occur when you start thinking about the edge, moving from what was essentially a wireline internet uh, oriented um, interconnection platform for, for, for different subnetworks coming together and moving that now to addition, additional facilities, which we've acquired as part of American Tower, merging those together into a portfolio here, where we become an, a, a sort of a, a leading edge solution from the infrastructure and in partnering with you know, the cloud on ramps, for example, that are prevalent in some of these facilities, how we move to these edge data centers. We have six that we put at tower sites and we're using those to explore different use cases and requirements from the customer base that are looking to colo in those facilities. And as operators, in this case, the mobile network operators move to 5G and the user plane function gets unbundled and exited at different parts of the network, we think that the tower portfolio will be a great place for that traffic to exit, at least when it needs to exit. And then the workloads need to dynamically be discovered uh, where the resources are and how those applications will, will feed the, the end users because mobility does add a different uh, and more complex dimension. So this is, this is the asset base that we have. And I just wanted to then spend a few minutes talking about some of the projects that, that we, are, we are working on. So 
the first one I wanted to talk about was an ORAM project we started uh, right around after the pandemic hit. Uh, we, we started working with a number of partners. We had already been a member in, in a university called Aachen in Germany. And what we had done there was a Wi-Fi 6 solution to, to be able to provide some in-building services for the community there. And as a member of um, their you know, future networking, um, you know, let's call it platforms that they're developing there, we, we put together a solution with some partners to consider a 5G standalone ORAN solution. And that would be targeting different use cases within Industrial 4.0. There's a factory uh, partner there. There's other campus use cases. And so we, we started putting that together. It's up and operational now. And as we move through the process, you know, it's, it's got, you know, a, in some of the partners that are based on, you know, Kubernetes open source solutions using um, microservices uh, as the basic software architecture and trying to look at, you know, again, 5G SA devices coming online to be able to look at multiple IoT in private networks. Now, when we talk about this, we look at it as a hybrid network. So initially it might be serving just private users within the university community there as a test bed, but then ultimately we see demand from mobile operators wanting to also use that same platform. And in Germany, there's a unique piece of spectrum called location spectrum, which is really open to private users for on-prem applications. And we see the opportunity for someone like American Tower as a neutral host to be able to put those pieces together as a single shared RAN as a service. So we're, we're seeing some really good um, opportunities for that type of platform. And as ORAN further develops, we think we can roll that out, not just there, but in other markets as well. I think in the US, the equivalent would be CBRS and you see a lot of demand for that. And open source features prominently in, 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 these, in these platforms. Um, the, the other one I wanna talk on the upper right is, is our work in the Paris to Connect. So we've been, for several years working with a community of, of, uh, of, of partners there. There's five partners there that have been driving an innovation around nine uh, poles, smart pole, you know, three kilometer loop in the city of Paris really was set up for uh, autonomous platforms like a shuttle between two uh, rail stations. And while the shuttle isn't yet operational, it's got a CVDX component. Uh, it's got, you know, sort of a small cell access component and it's got a number of sensors, LIDAR, radar, uh, cameras, uh, and even acoustic sensors. So a rich IoT environment. And then that data, you know, in, in the GDPR and other requirements for security and for privacy is extracted into a cloud, um, public cloud. And then it's been opened up to third party innovators to take that data set and start to apply it for different applications and use cases that they could, they could develop based on you know, uh, MQTT and other types of uh, video enabled uh, capabilities for even classification of some of the data in the video streams. So that's another project where open source is, is, is playing a key role. Um, on the lower left, we just had an announcement a few weeks ago with some partners in, in the 5GA consortium that we work in, really trying to figure out how do you build the edge for mobile uh, automotive applications now there's a way that you can do it with, you can use individual networks and do things uh, where you know, all the devices go to that one network. But when you start looking at reality, multiple networks need to come together. So we think you know, between the, OE, the automotive OEMs, the, the multiple MNOs and the requirements for low latency, there's a real need for this, um, let's call it neutral host edge, uh, which will be closer to the tower sites than where they are today you know, in order to manage the, the sort of having more deterministic latency bounds and to have applications that are that are really tied to mobility at the intersection, blending together vulnerable roadside users, sort of uh, information sensor cameras, as well as the vehicles themselves. Those things are being put together and we're building a test bed with DTTI, Virginia Tech. And we see that as an opportunity for a lot of the open source community to play a role. As we look at particularly some of the discussions earlier on the 5G, uh, you know, the super blueprint, we, we think there's some opportunities there as well. And you're tying together, in this case, multi-access. You have the wireline requirements that come from DOTs for the signal phase and timing, which is current today in a lot of intersections that are connected and, and controlled. That data set sent, tends to go back to a portal and the latencies on that is, is really too long for, for you know, automotive uh, OEMs to be able to take advantage of that as we look to in, in improve safety, but also 
there's an ESG component there too in terms of uh, performance uh, in anticipation of a light change at the intersection, whether you speed up or slow down. So we, we see a lot of opportunities there to, to partner with, with uh, the LF Edge uh, community. And then finally with LF Edge, the fundamental component here is, is really trying to bridge together the slide I showed earlier, which is we have this core infrastructure with CoreSight. We have the connectivity uh, in a lot of those facilities with the clouds. And then bringing that to the mobile operators, which are already existing on many of our power sites, how do you bring those two worlds together in a way that drives not only you know, vertical applications in a particular access network, but horizontal applications that will drive, say, the metaverse and other capabilities that we think are coming. So a lot of requirements there. And I think the, the LF Edge community is doing a lot to, with the blueprints to be able to sort through that and make it, let's call it more efficient, lower cost, and more secure to be able to realize that vision. So this is a big part of why we, we joined the community. And so we have this multi-pronged approach. Uh, we see a lot of the blueprints is resonating with us and, and we're really happy to be part of supporting the open source community. And then finally, um, just summarizing some of the things we've done in terms of participation, we're global and we have a lot of, uh, let's call it, you know, places in the, in, the, in, the, in the different standards bodies and different alliances where we're starting to show up. Again, we've been historically a power company uh, since I've come on for the last five years, we're, we're shifting to an infrastructure company. And so we're looking at broadening from just space to space power and then space power networking. Uh, those things uh, really come together. And then computing is really what we hope to enable uh, both at the edge and anywhere in the networks where we might be deploying active gear, such as in building or maybe in some rural you know, opportunities around the world to connect the unconnected. So one of the things that, that I think is really important, and I know, um, you know thinking forward in the future, I've seen some of the hints in that direction is when you look at the 5G super blueprint, you know, how do you get to an, a 5G RAN, open, an open, stack, open source stack for, for the RAN? I think that would go a long way towards simplifying some things. And then still keeping some of the differentiated uh, requirements there uh, you know, uh, set up for, for suppliers to, to really you know, create value around the scheduler and other components such as that. Uh, with that, I am uh, gonna wrap up. I think you know, I wanted to just be short, ARPIT. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity. We're just starting our journey here in support of the open source community. And we appreciate the time today and thank everyone for, for all the great work they've done to date in, the, in support of you know, not, not only uh, the historical work, but the, the recent work in, in enabling 5G and the, and the wireless community as well. Awesome, and thank you very much. This was very insightful. I, I'm sure people have a lot of questions. I think I see a couple. Um, the, there, was a, there was a mention of CBRS, and uh, I think in one of your uh, use cases, uh, what are your uh, specifics uh, around CBRS you know, in terms of demand or, or use cases or uh, from a market perspective? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, we've, we've been part of CBRS for like, I don't know, six years, I think, when it was first CBRS Alliance and then now it's ongo. We do retain a board membership there. And, you know, we've seen like with the pandemic, a, a real inflection point. You know, there's a, there's a little bit of a 4G to 5G transformation issue that's going on that, that I think uh, also causes some uh, challenge because, you know, you want to deploy today, you got 4G, but then you really want to make sure that the, the hardware and the network architecture is, is future-proof to 5G. I think some of the underlying silicon and components are, are making that transition, and especially as we get to disaggregated solutions. Um, we're seeing, you know, a lot of demand. It starts out in pure private settings, right? There's a lot of work that's being done in factories and warehouses, those types of components, uh, and those types of uh, locations, and also in fixed wireless. Uh, we see a lot of the. There's, I think, close to 300,000 CBSDs now deployed. There's an ongoing mm -hmm. conference in Philadelphia, which I'll head over to right after this call, to to work with the CBS community and. Uh, there's a lot of you know outdoor or fixed wireless uh, you know nodes that have been deployed in building. You know we see opportunities as you move beyond DAS and you take the the architecture and scale it into a lot of tier two uh, type properties, office buildings, healthcare facilities, hospitality. Those buildings have have traditionally been outside in for lower frequencies, and when we move to 5G and mid band and higher frequencies, in order to retain that quality of service between outside and in. 
you know, we think more operators will have to build in there. And we think the architecture will shift from DAS to something more ORAN like, and that's what we're proposing to support. So we see tremendous opportunity and the, and the market's moving forward. There's a lot of players maybe you know, jumped out early, but I think that, that eventually settle and, I, and then you'll see some, some significant growth in the future. Got it, great. Uh, I do have one more question, uh, which is, uh, you know, you're kind of sitting in a very unique position in the network, right? You're sandwiched with the RAN, you're sandwiched with the physical aspects of things and then the cloud and the core on the other side, right? And you did mention the importance of open source and open, open source frameworks and sort of blueprints, right? Uh, clearly, uh, you know, as an organization uh, in, in, your, in your space, you may not have all the skills of software uh, or you are maybe developing skills of the software. How, how important is it uh, from your perspective uh, uh, you know, the, the, the value of these frameworks and how much do you rely on the community to help you out on, on, on making sure that the software is kind of uh, uh, a critical part of, of the solution because, you know, it's, it's kind of a sandwich. You on know, both sides, right? I, it's, it's a good question. I think the way I, I look at this is a lot of the projects we are doing, we're trying to work with, with some of the new, more agile innovators, right? And not to say that other people aren't innovating and put a lot of R&D, but the traditional suppliers is an easy button, right? People can go to them and they know they'll get a, an integrated solution that works. And what we're trying to do is, is push the envelope a bit here. And so what it does is it means that some of these, some of these other players, there's a little bit of a risk, right? Will they, will they be there long-term? And when you think about depending on open source platforms, it gives you that confidence level that says, there's a community behind it. So it's not just this one business. And then when I put those pieces together, granted there's more risk in integration. And, but over the life cycle, if you look at some of the projects that, that uh, the Linux Foundation is supporting is, how do you make sure that code base is, is going to be robust? How do you make sure that all of the CI CD tools are there? The testing is there, at least for some of the blueprints. And, and that gives us more confidence that we're working with smaller suppliers. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's, you know, it's important to have encouraged the innovation in the small suppliers. I think that's some of the premise behind ORAN, frankly, is that I think it's like four or five OEMs support 96% of, of, the, of the wireless equipment globally. So those, you know, 100 billion plus investment goes to four companies, four or five companies, generally speaking, for, for the wireless network. So opening that up and, and, and having some additional innovation really is is much more i think secure in in a end user's mind when when the open source community is also backing up those 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 protocol stacks and the underlying sort of software platforms and architectures so that's very good i think an important element from my perspective doesn't Excellent. mean you know we wouldn't use you know open source wherever we could we're not putting it together necessarily ourselves we're, we're not at that low level of like you said we don't have the software team in place to do that but we're relying on partners to do that for us. Excellent, beautiful, very insightful. And uh, thank you very much for, for addressing this, this community here. Appreciate it. Uh, and thank you very much. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Okay.